Welcome folks, we are in Matthew Lesson 37. I just got back a couple of days ago from taking a little time off. Um, I just did the Angels Message, uh, Angels Part 7, and that is at gbible.org, or it's on my homepage here on YouTube. As you guys know, I always try to get them on there, and you are aware that anytime you like a video, it goes on your page, so... Uh, any of the videos you see that I like go on that front homepage of mine. Um, some of them I'll have to do with political things that I trust, um, that I vetted. So I know there's been a couple of emails I've got asking questions about certain people online. To me, everything is getting uh, much more deceiving, much more cloudy. Um, there are more attacks from the far left progressives. So uh, I don't know if you can trust everybody. There's things I've heard about some people in the past two or three years online that I've trusted for news that are um, under attack right now and there's good things being said about them and bad things so there's a lot going on it's very volatile time um, all the owners and the big names of these platforms like Google and Apple and Facebook and whatnot they're going in front of the government for a reason all right uh, they're in bed with the CIA folks and the NSA and they and they they got in bed with them a long time ago um, it's probably a political commentary for another day but I've heard some things about Zuckerberg and uh, the, the original owner of Apple and some other folks as well that, that are at the high end of these these media platforms and these computer-based uh, media outlets um, and social media outlets that are uh, connected with our CIA and our covert operators. And uh, that's how come they are, are in control of everything and they're able to monitor and do the algorithms and all that. So it's probably a message or a, a political commentary for another day, but I'm warning people to be very careful what you believe, what you follow. I try to vet those folks that I like and give a thumbs up to that go on my homepage with my videos uh, from gbible.org. But, uh, you know, I, sometimes I get them wrong as well. But so far I've been pretty accurate with who I follow because I go over their stuff several different times and I try to vet different avenues and, and check different sites and then I'll go back on even some old original news sites um, that are out there that you can hardly trust anymore, but just to see what's what and kind of figure it all out. Um, and so the majority that I put on there are pretty accurate. If you're asking me about who to follow, those are some of the ones I follow on there. You might not like some of them. I don't know. You know, um, they might not be your cup of tea, but um, you know, we have to get our news sources from other places except for the big name media outlets like the MSNBC, the CNN, the NSNBCs. All these ones that have been around a long time, because as I told you before, there was something called uh, Project Mockingbird that went into effect in the early 50s from the CIA getting involved in news outlets. Um, and they've infiltrated it from way back when. Trust me when I tell you, they never let go. They claim they did in the 70s when they got caught with certain things. Like they've claimed they've stopped doing everything. It's a lie. Uh, they're deeply, deeply involved in a lot of the media. So they control the narrative. So you don't always get to hear everything. They leave out pieces of the sandwich, like I say, or sometimes they focus on something that has nothing to do with the real news going on to keep your eye on the ball over here while something else politically is going on over there. So that's my commentary for the beginning of this one. Uh, thanks for tuning in and, and follow me. I appreciate all your support, everybody. This is Matthew, Lesson 37. It is called Salt and Light of the Earth. So we are in Matthew chapter 5. Let's take a moment of silent prayer and let's keep... North Carolina in prayer. They're getting hit. North Carolina, South Carolina. Let's keep them in prayer. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we have to study your word, Father. We're asking you to, to reach your powerful hand out there on the East Coast, down the highway from me a ways into the Carolinas, and, and protect those people. I know the floods are going to come and the, and the rain is heavy, so they need your protection, Father. Let those first responders stay safe and let them get out there and help the people they need to get out there, Father. And let's focus on this message through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, salt and light of the earth. So let's get into it. As we go deeper into Matthew chapter 5, this crash course of doctrine the apostles are getting is highlighting in a transitional period, actually. And that takes place um, during the, the uh, transition between what I would say the age of for these new believers, the age of Israel and uh, the law still being in effect, and then the transition to the new church age and Christ coming. He was the hypostatic union. We call it the age of the hypostatic union as well. So there's a transition going on here when Christ is, is teaching this, and it's all going to come to fruition during the day of Pentecost when the church age comes to fruition. So also, this has a vision or a look into future events as these guys are sitting there learning under the 
under the tutelage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But let's pick it up where we left off in last lesson. We were in Matthew 5, 9. We're going to go Matthew 5, 10 and get into it a little bit and read forward. Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, Christ says. Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice. Be glad. We talked about that last time. For your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way that they persecuted the prophets who were before you, Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt. This is what we're going to look at a little bit today. Salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill. It cannot be hidden. Verse 15, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. You are the salt of the earth. Great statement. Salt in the ancient world was not only for flavor, but it was a food preservative, as many of you know, and it still has that value today, actually, which was of, of great value back then, actually. It saved food for days or weeks at a time, and in some ancient cities... If you do your research, some ancient cities, salt had the value of currency. It had the value of currency. So you could get a three or four pound bag of salt and it would be like having a gold coin in some cities. Very interesting I found that to be. I knew it was valuable. I didn't realize it was that valuable, but it's very interesting. The positive believers become a preservative to the earth. Many times in history, God spared a city or even an entire region from destruction due to one or two positive believers. Noah and the ark is of course a great example, but Joseph as the governor of Egypt, that's another example. Those are two great examples right there. And we often refer to that as a pivot, a pivot of positive believers, or the Bible says a remnant, a remnant of believers, a remnant of God's people. But God never, he never forces us to become positive or negative. He never backs us into a corner and says, be positive, or forces us so much that we become negative. It's really up to us. We're left up to our own choices. And I actually got into that, our responsibility, during my Angel series for you that have been uh, keeping up with it. Like I said, if not, go check it out. It just got put up the other day when I got back from vacation. The apostles had the option, the option, to go negative. And one did. Judas Iscariot, right? So if the salt has become tasteless, if is a third class condition in the Greek which says maybe you will, maybe you won't, kind of leaves you a question mark there. The apostles were never backed into a corner by the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They stayed the course willingly long after he ascended back to heaven. They stayed the course, they stuck it out. At any point they could have quit. At any point they could have quit. At any point they could have folded under pressure like many people do and agreed with the Pharisees and the Roman leadership and made a public statement against Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Think about it. They could have went forward and made a public statement and all the harassment and jail time and persecution of their friends and family and themselves would have stopped. Do you realize? Think about it. Do you realize if any of the apostles would have done that, they would have been elevated to a very high honor in whatever area they were in when they proclaimed that Christ was not the Messiah. They would have been elevated at that point, given great power and wealth, and they would have been community leaders and respected. Instead, these men faced certain death and stayed the course. They faced certain death and they stayed the course, preaching and teaching Christ crucified until they themselves were either crucified or killed in some way, shape, or form other than John, who it appears was on Patmos for quite a while, came off there and died of old age. But Patmos couldn't have been a great place to be because it was an island for insane people, crazy people. When Matthew 5.13 teaches us about salt losing its flavor, no longer good for anything except to be what thrown out, trampled underfoot by men, this is actually a warning and it is one of those things I always talk about, a dual kind of meaning, a two, double meaning to it. And scripture usually has double and triple and quadruple meanings, but this one really definitely has a dual meaning. And it's, it's in the area of discipline that many believers do not recognize. They do not fully recognize it. They don't fully understand it. As positive believers, we are to do our best to stay within the plan of God. Our responsibility, stay within the plan of God. Be involved in evangelizing. That's one of our basic callings. Praying for others. Being a light, being a salt, being a Christian light to help shine the path for others. 
Just being available when God needs us in certain areas for somebody down here. Let maybe people uh, to see your life and they uh, see you go through something and you're a Christian, the way you handle it changes their life. So we have responsibility even beyond evangelism down here. When we go opposite of the plan of God for our life, at some point, at some point, not always at, at the beginning, but at some point when we stay long enough, discipline will be brought it's usually brought in, and it's usually to wake us up at first. And nine times out of ten, it's usually reaping what you sow first before God comes down and gives you a spanking. He allows you to reap some misery of what you do, just the natural consequences of what you do. And it'll let you go for quite a while sometimes. And if you don't come back, eventually he will bring that hand of discipline in and, and try to guide you back. The dual part of this for believers is that the cosmic system will also attack and bring misery in your life. It's guaranteed, especially if you're a believer. Some believers who stray too far get hit from both sides. That's what I'm talking about. At some juncture in their life, they could get whacked by both. A discipline from Satan and the cosmic system attacking them, and then finally the hand of God coming in and giving them a little spanking to get them back in line. And setting themselves up for a dual trampling, as this uh, says in Matthew chapter 5. Trampled underfoot has the implication of not only getting divine discipline, but also trampled by men in the world, stepped on, being used as a doormat by the cosmic system. What we need to clarify is dead works here. We're going to take a look at something called dead works. It's that salt that loses its taste. And when we talk about salt that has no flavor, I want you to think about dead works. Some of you folks have heard about it. I'll explain it a little bit. It's not really that complicated. Dead works, so we could say salt in this case we're looking at, that is useless, lost its flavor is when a believer is operating, working, and striving outside the plan of God. They're still trying to walk as a Christian, but they're really doing it in the flesh. They're not applying doctrine. They're not filled with the Spirit. Their motivation's wrong. They're minus the filling power of the Holy Spirit. They actually have that wrong motivation. There's a form of arrogance in it, or they want attention, or they're doing something for shame or guilt. Some kind of emotional tentacle is attached to it. Or they, somebody else has talked them into doing something, and they're doing it. Or they're trying to show God, look how good I am. You have to be careful with all that. It ends up being dead works. This believer can be a church-going church -going believer who talks about God, quotes scripture accurately. Many people memorize and quote scripture. It does not mean they're good Christians. It's good if you can do it. But I can tell you right now, from <laughs> some of my history as a younger man, my memory sometimes fails me. I want to say 1 Timothy chapter 3 in my mind, all verse 5, and I'm actually thinking of 2 Timothy 4 verse 6. <laughs> you know, so, but there are people who can quote it off the top of their head and throw scripture out there, yet they're not spiritual, but they think they are. It doesn't matter how much scripture you can memorize or how often you attend church if you do not, do not understand the filling power of the Holy Spirit and having right motivation in your heart. It is useless, folks. Wood, hay, and stubble, it's dead works. It starts with salvation first and realizing you didn't earn or deserve anything. You better always realize that. You can, I don't care if you're 25 years into your walk with God. You better always have it in the back of your mind that salvation wasn't something you earned or deserved that you somehow helped out. You didn't. You didn't. God the Holy Spirit found you spiritually dead. He applied the CPR, got in your path somehow or another, and breathed you back to life. You had one second of a positive attitude or a moment when you felt helpless and you knew that you needed a Savior, and the Spirit came in and did the work. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget. It's not about guilt. I'm just telling you, don't forget that. We actually deserve everlasting torment. We do. We, we have an old sin nature, but we're given this grace. We're given this mercy. It's all about grace. Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, works, flesh, which we have done in righteousness, trying to be righteous, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration, by who? Renewing of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration. I actually, like I said, I've done some terminology on this page. You can go back now. I have a year's worth of doctrine on this page. Well, coming up on a year, I think. Go back. I've been putting messages on here once or twice a week, sometimes three times, if I could, not just the political commentary. Stop getting interested in that and not the doctrine. Get interested in both. <laughs> Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For by grace, by grace you have been saved through faith. That is not of yourselves. Gift from God. It is a gift from God. Get it through your head. It is a gift from God. Dead works are seen every day all around us. All around us. Many denominations that do not fully understand mystery doctrine and the power of the Holy Spirit, we see it there a lot.
unfortunately. See, the world holds up many spiritual leaders of differing denominations as these great saints who do so much good for the communities. Maybe it's for the poor or doing something in a third world, third world country, and that's great. That's great. Yet, we do not even know, truthfully, if they're true believers. We don't know. Uh, um, what is it? Mother Teresa used to get a ton of credit. She could have been this great believer. She might have all kinds of rewards in heaven, or she might not have been a, a true believer at all. We don't know. It appears she was. But how much of that would, was she filled with the Spirit and had the right motivation when she did what she did? I don't know. She's probably a spiritual giant. I'm just saying, I want you to think about these things. Helping the poor, going to third world countries, all that stuff is great, awesome. Yet we do not know what true believers believe in their heart. Are they filled with the Spirit? Do they truly believe in the Christ, Jesus Christ we know? And what is their motivation? What is your motivation? That's big. Most people, most people do good deeds out of their own guilt or it makes them feel better there's some kind of emotional tickle there that gets them shame guilt happiness i feel better i look what i did whatever it is if you peel the onion back the psyche back a little bit you find out it's usually an emotional high of some sorts or another or an emotional low if you want to say guilt or shame some some pulpits use guilt or shame to get people to donate time and money to a community project and that's really evil you shouldn't do that People should do things on their own with the right motivation, filled with the Spirit. Just a natural walk, walking in the new man. Isaiah 64, 6, For all of us, all, underline all, have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. The things we think we're doing a lot of times out of our flesh is nothing but filthy garments, and all of us wither like a leaf in our iniquities, like the wind take us away. Okay, you don't want to know. Some of you do, but you don't want to know the Hebrew language behind filthy garments. It isn't pretty. It isn't pretty. It has to do with the ladies and a once a month issue, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. So uh, we'll move on. Uh, Romans 8.8. 8. And those who are in the flesh, there it is, in the flesh cannot please God. Cannot. Cannot do it. And Galatians 2.16 tells us a man is not justified. By the works of the law. In other words, following guidelines and standards, certainly those standards in the Old Testament, and saying, look, I'm going to do this, this, and this. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to pay my taxes. Everything's good. I'm a good boy or a good girl. Therefore, I'm justified and righteous and walking. I don't know. Are you filled with the Spirit? Are you motivated? Do you have doctrine motivating you? But it says, man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith. It's always faith, right? Faith and grace, hand in hand, in Jesus Christ. God looks at your heart. God looks at your heart. So when I tell you that a believer who has lost his or her taste, that salt in reference to being salt of the earth, I'm telling you that many believers are involved in dead works. They just are. Revelation 20, 12 through 15 tells us God looks at our deeds, how as well as why they were done, how as well as why. Many believers think they're going to have these great rewards lined up in heaven for all their good deeds, yet it will be burned up. Wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and straw. Wood, hay, and stubble. First uh, Corinthians 3, 12 through uh, 15 gets into this because it's basically dead works. Dead works. Without the power, that filling power of the Holy Spirit, doctrinal content in your soul structure, most of the time you will perform good deeds and works from your flesh in some form or another. So just think about that. The next time you go to do something good, what's my motivation? Am I doing this because it's the right thing to do? I'm a Christian. It's the right thing to do. I don't care who sees me. In fact, I don't want anybody to know that I'm doing something good. I'm just going to go ahead and do it, and I'm going to make sure I, I'm filled with the Spirit by name and inside any known sins, and I'm going to go forward in my new nature and do the best I can with this job. Now you have something. Now you have something. The strength of your faith is tested when you begin to get involved in helping others. The strength of your faith will be tested when you help others. Because some people will turn around a week or two months or two years later and slap you right in the face. How are you going to react then? Why did you do it? Are you going to say, I regret doing that for them? Think about it. The strength of your faith will be tested when you begin to get involved in helping others and reaching outside of your circle of family and friends. It will be. Romans 14, 23. You can't have that doubt, right? For anything that lacks faith is, 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 is sin, actually. Romans 14, 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he is eating not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. And this is speaking about the different... Uh, uh, Old Testament um, 
rules and regulations about food or whatnot. It's actually a lesson probably for another day. But the B part of that, the last part, is that very important, what Paul was saying. Whatever is not from faith is sin. He's trying to clarify, like, you guys don't even realize. You think you're doing, eating something or acting a certain way or doing something that you found in the, in the Torah or whatever, and you're following this, and you think that makes you righteous or pure or you're doing something in the spirit, and you're really in the flesh. So whatever is not a faith is sin. Remember, the Pharisees, scribes, and the Sadducees were always doing good. They were. People don't realize that. They were arrogant and everything, but they did good deeds out in the public square. They did a lot of good deeds out in the public square. They craved the attention of others. Now, behind closed doors, they could they'd look down their nose on somebody that was less than them. But sometimes they would walk out in a, in a public square and do something. Make a prayer for a blind man or something, a public prayer in front of everybody. They craved the attention of others and made them feel holy or righteous to put a spiritual show on in front of everybody and let everybody see what they were doing. you got to check your motivation at the door, folks. Hebrews 6.1, therefore, leaving the elementary principles, the elementary teachings about Christ, get past all that. Okay? Salvation. Understand that. Understand redemption. Understand the filling of the Spirit. Press on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Not continuing in these little basic doctrines. This is explaining the problem of those who do not grow beyond salvation and only remain in a cycle of repenting from sin, then falling back into old habits or lifestyle choices, then starting all over again. And they're continuing over and over again. And most of their life, they're in and out of church, in and out of church. They gain no momentum. They really don't understand mystery doctrine, the filling power of the Spirit. They never get the right motivation. So they're kind of stuck at this repentance stage constantly. Spiritual growth means momentum. The snowball going downhill begins to build in your walk with God. Basic biblical principles, they should become second nature to you. I'm just telling you that. For you, and you should want to reach for a deeper knowledge into the Word. You know, if you're born again and saved, and you're looking back on the last 8 or 10 years, and you're thinking you're still kind of just bouncing in and out of the church, and you know a couple of basic doctrines, you're 10 years in, you should start reaching for deeper knowledge and fully understanding what your walk is, what you're calling. God might be calling you to do something, and because you're not getting any momentum, you can't even hear that still small voice. Many believers, many, do not grow beyond basic doctrines. And therefore, they think the spiritual life is working hard to please God. Show up on Sunday and put a $10 bill in the basket, and they think they're spiritual. They fall into sins, and they have shame and guilt that set them back, and they try to work hard to get back that lost ground. Vicious cycle, grieving and quenching the spirit. That's what it means, grieving and quenching the spirit. It's a vicious cycle, folks. It really is. And it inflames, that cycle actually inflames the flesh, the old sin nature, to work harder trying to prove to self and to others that you can live up to an imaginary standard. I'm just going to be good. This week was really good. God loves me more. What a bunch of nonsense. You don't understand your position, your condition. You don't understand some really deep doctrinal principles, and it's sad. People get caught up in morality, being good. I'm good. Okay, that's, that's, that's good that you're doing that, but you can be unbelievers. There's a lot of unbelievers that are very moral. A lot of unbelievers that are very moral. There's a whole bunch... I would probably say in the millions of, of Muslims, and some of them probably radical, that it can be very moral. Morality and outward deeds are not the way a believer reaches maturity. This is what they do after they gain spiritual ground. You know the cart before the horse saying? That's what this is about. The Pharisees were moral. They performed plenty of good deeds, yet the majority of them turned out to be unbelievers. We don't know how many. Some were believers. And they were filled with legalistic arrogance. Filled with it. I'm going to have you guys move on to verse 14. I hope you understand what I'm talking about by the salt losing its taste and dead works. Because those are some examples I'm showing you. Pharisees was constant dead works. Almost all of them. Just a warning. Just a warning that what someone does on the outside does not always reveal who they are on the inside. What someone does on the outside does not always reveal who they are on the inside. You could have a spiritually mature believer have a bad day and you just see him during that day and you don't realize this is a spiritually mature believer who's got a ton of momentum. He has a bad day. Maybe he does something in his flesh or maybe he's doing something you don't fully understand and you judge it and think he's not spiritually mature. You have no idea. You have no idea because you're looking for the outward, so much of the outward. It's really, really sad, people. You know, we could you do studies on Jacob and David and 
uh, some of the Old Testament guys, and even some of our apostles. You can look at certain things, decisions they made that were foolish. You know, and, and, you could, and you could scorn them and say, oh, they couldn't have been spiritually mature. How do you know? How do you know what their motivation, do you know what they were going through? Be very careful how you judge and evaluate. Matthew 5, 14. Here's the other part of this. Light. You are the light of the world, the salt, the light. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. This scripture is another clear statement that we have a divine purpose in this life. You have a destiny. You have a purpose. This is what it's saying. Jesus Christ is telling them, especially these guys who he's telling are going to be leaders. They're important as well. But we follow them. They're our founding fathers. So think about it. Believers are needed in this world because there is a darkness. There is a darkness on many levels that Satan and the fallen angels have cast upon the entire population. Part of our commission as believers, as ambassadors, as evangelists for Christ is to live our life as Christians in full view of the world. Full view. That means stepping out sometimes and speaking about Christ and not being afraid about it. We're not to tie ourselves and bind ourselves to the world's standards and copy the behavior on believers trying to fit in so we don't get embarrassed. Be very careful about that, folks. 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be bound. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? I'm going to tell you a little marriage advice right now. Ladies... You can have the kindest, gentlest, most moral man. If you are a believer and he is not a believer, there's probably going to be a problem. You make your own decision. Just be very, very careful when it comes to marriage and who you're binding yourself to as close friends and family and especially marriage. Be very careful. Many times, Scripture describes Christians as beacons of light. There's a reason for that because the world is so dark. There's a reason for it. But we're not to have that kind of fellowship continually with darkness. You have to be in it. You have to be around it. This is the world we live in. We have to be in the world. We are not of the world. We are a pool of tumas is the word. We're citizens of heaven. But many times scripture describes Christians as these beacons, these lights, even uh, candles or lights or lanterns. John 12, 36. While you have the light, believe in the light, Jesus Christ, right? So that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and he went away and hid himself from them. In the physical absence, in the physical absence of our Lord, right now, in time, the believer is the light. We are the light for a lost and dying world. Think about it. That's a responsibility for us. Romans 2.19, and are you confident that you are yourself are a what? You're a guide, you're a light to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. You see, unbelievers are said to be in a lost and dying world. Lost and dying world. They're in the darkness whether they believe they are or not. Many, of course, they don't think they are. But this is what the Lord, the Savior Jesus Christ said. Ephesians 5, 8. You were formerly in darkness. You were formerly an unbeliever. But now you're in the light. Walk as children of light. When we witness and live a life that reflects the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're shining our very own light. We're shining a path so others can see. Isaiah 9, 2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light, the coming Christ, coming Messiah. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Jesus Christ, the most powerful light, yet the believers, the believers in time, right now, the church age, who unite together and follow the Lord's lead can shine a witness light for many, many people to see. Unity, though. You have to have some unity, right, for it to, the light to be really bright. You have to always have that concept of what you say, what you do in your daily life can have great impact on someone you might not even know. You might not even know somebody and you have impact on their life. You might not even talk directly to them and they were just in the periphery where you were at. Maybe they watched you go through something or do something kind for somebody in, while you were in walking in your new nature. And they're like, I want to have what that guy has. I want, to, I want to be able to handle things the way she handles things. Maybe there's someone in your neighborhood or at your job that you don't even get along with. Right? They, and they'll see you. They'll see your Christian light shine during a difficult situation and it'll change their lives forever. You could change somebody's lives forever and not even know it. You know when you're going to know it? In heaven when you get some kind of reward for it. That's when you're going to know it. Matthew 5, 14. A city on a hill. A city set on a hill. Speaks to the unity of believers who come together under one truth, one spirit, one goal. That's important. Because you can have a whole bunch of denominations that believe a lot of different stuff. And there's not a lot of unity there. That becomes the problem. A city set on a hill speaks to unity of believers with one truth, one goal, one spirit, right? One Christ, 
all the same thing. They can be living uh, a living light, a witness, but a living light, like a torch or a lantern. That city, those believers, can only be seen from a distance if all the lights are shining. You know, in the ancient world, if you were 20 miles away from a city and there was only one little candle in a window, you could hardly see it. But boy, if everything was lit up and the lanterns were on the street corners are lit up, you could be, if depending on what type of night it is and how much, you know, uh, uh, flat land you had in front of you, you could see the outline of the city, the glow of it in the distance. Now look back at Matthew 5, verses 15. 5, 15. This light concept was important enough for our Lord to use several times during his ministry. He brought it up several times. It went hand in hand with the salt, the salt of the earth analogy. Matthew 5, 15. I'll give you a moment to get there. If you're not already there. 5.15, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. This is a great principle right here. But on the lampstand, you set it up the right way, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Ask yourself something, and, you, and yourself in the mirror. How many Christians in our day and age, and yourself included, are afraid to shine their light in public? How many? The devil's world is having a successful campaign in 2018, making Christianity a shadow of what it was 50 or 60 years ago in this country. I can tell you that right now. People don't like to bring up the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, I always tell people, you can talk about God, because there's all kinds of gods, millions of gods, right? Go back into the ancient world, you see gods, gods, gods. This is a god, that's a god. But bring up that name, Jesus Christ, as the one true God, one true Savior. Bring his name up in conversation. You will see people get intense you want to get somebody's back up when you're talking they're talking religion and spirituality and christianity or different things bring up jesus christ see how many times you can get away with that name in the conversation without somebody getting upset unless you're sitting with a, a group of positive believers people don't like to bring up the lord and savior jesus christ they do not talk about prayer and spiritual guidance the christian way when someone they know is struggling whatever light they have is hidden under a basket it's like putting a basket over you hidden. And I'm not suggesting, listen to me, I always balance things out. I was taught the right way by my mentor, Pastor Bob McLaughlin. I'm not suggesting you stand on a street corner and shout, the Lord is coming, repent. That scares people away. I'm not talking about craziness and nonsense, folks. Nor should you put your job in jeopardy over speaking about the gospel of Christ every time you walk into work. You have to be careful. I worked in the human service field for the better part of 15 years, and I got into middle management. I had to be very careful. When you work with people with disabilities, and you work with social workers, and you're in and out of group homes and day programs and all that, you can't be throwing around your Christian beliefs on people because you don't know who's with you, and if you're dealing with somebody with a weaker mind than you, you could influence them, and those powers that be in that company are thinking, are you trying to promote your Christian stuff so they follow you? It was a nightmare. You could, we even, at the end of it, you couldn't say Christmas. We had to say holiday celebrations. So that's where it went. That's, that's how far it's gone. But use common sense, folks. But certainly don't be afraid to admit you're a Christian or offer, offer biblical advice when it's asked. Those around you that need it, don't be afraid. Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine. There it is. Let it shine before men. Such a way that you may see your divine good works, not dead works, divine and glorify your Father who's in heaven. The works in view here come from a believer with maturity who has proper motivation the filling power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot glorify God in your flesh, folks. You cannot glorify God in your flesh. So this is directly related to spiritual works that come only from Bible doctrine in your soul structure. You have it in there. You understand it. It's motivated you the right way. You are, you're at ease with yourself. You're doing things for the right way. You know how to ask a forgiveness of sins. You're filled with the Spirit. You go forward, and then you apply it the right way. Now you're, there is a credit there for you if you want to look at it that way. But look what Paul told the church at Corinth. They had a lot of issues going on there. 2 Corinthians 3.12, you are a letter. What a great way to put it, right? You're a letter. How many people can get handed a letter and read it? And a letter stays with you, right? Written in our hearts. Known and read by all men. Verse 3, being manifested that you are a letter of who? Christ, not yourself. Cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit. The Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. In the soul structure, engraved in there. Too often, too often, believers mistake emotion for the filling of the Holy Spirit. They mistake emotion for the filling of the Holy There's whole denominations that when you go into their Bible study of their church... 
by the mid-service, people are sweating, screaming in different tongues and yelling and slapping people on the head and healing. And it's, it turns into like a circus or a magic show. But too often, believers mistake emotions for the filling of the Holy Spirit. They confuse busy work out in the community with divine good. They don't understand it all. They don't understand what's behind the motivation. Let me leave you with a good example. A good example. If you're out in the community feeding the poor, helping those less fortunate, and you're doing that not for any other reason, not for any other reason, then you know it's the right thing to do. You're a Christian. You feel it's right. You're being led by the Spirit to do that. You feel you're led to do so because your relationship with God, and you have named and cited your known sins, and you're operating in the new man filled with the Holy Spirit. You're doing divine good works. At that point, you're doing divine good works. I hope you understand what that means, and I hope you understand that we're all considered salt and light of the earth. Salt and light of the earth. Jesus Christ used these analogies for the apostles so they could later on write these things and teach these things for our benefit. So think about these things. They're, they're fairly important for your spiritual walk. Do you want to be that person that just gets stuck in repenting from the same sins in a cycle you never grow because you're no, you have no momentum with your Bible study, with your relationship with God, with your filling of the Holy Spirit and the right motivation in your heart? Something to think about, folks. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time. I ask you to bless this message through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.